Hello. So recently I got done rewatching that HBO series Chernobyl, which by the way was a masterpiece. HBO, you straight up nailed it. RIP to the people of Chernobyl. Anyway, throughout the series I found myself a little bit confused about a couple things. Like why would the graphite control rods meant to slow down the reaction instead cause Chernobyl to explode and blow chunks all over the surrounding area? Like they had the AZ5 button there in case things went south and they needed to shut down the reaction. And then they press the button and then the whole place explodes? And what the hell is neutron flux? And no, why would no one tell this lady that it was not just a normal fire? I mean, the second time you saw him, he was covered in whatever that was, and then the first time he was fine. So, what kind of fire would do that? And then you went ahead and touched him anyway, which is like, how dumb? And if someone told her it wasn't a regular fire, maybe she could have still had a baby. Anyway, after I rewatched the series and did a weird amount of research, I decided to do an explainer video. I wanted to explain exactly how Chernobyl's RBMK reactor worked, how it functioned, the, uh, the balancing act that is the reaction inside the RBMK reactor, and what went wrong on literally one hour after my birthday, 1986. <laughs> So the power plant in Chernobyl was known as the RBMK-1000 nuclear fission reactor. As a fuel source, it used 2% enriched uranium dioxide. See, most of the uranium on Earth is in its more stable form, which is uranium-238. But a U-235 atom is unstable, and just so happens to release a lot of energy when it undergoes nuclear fission. As a uranium-235 atom absorbs a slower-moving neutron, that atom breaks apart, yielding two smaller atoms, which I'll get back to, around 200 mega electron volts, and on average about 2.4 neutrons. Then those neutrons find other U-235 atoms to slam into and break open, and if this fuel source was 100% enriched, meaning 100% U-235 and 0% U-238, just for the sake of this argument, I know less than 100 can still do the trick, this would quickly become an unstoppable chain reaction. But they found a clever way to keep the reaction more manageable. By only enriching the uranium by 2%, the neutrons released don't have nearly as many U-235 atoms to break open, and subsequently, less fissioning happens. And so the reaction needs less babysitting to keep it from running away and exploding. Keyword here is less. Things can still explode. In an RBMK reactor, the energy from this fissioning goes directly into converting water into steam, which turns the turbines of the generator, creating electricity. Now, back to the byproducts created in the reactor. Now, we know that energy and neutrons are being produced, but also being produced are isotopes. Isotopes are atoms with a normal amount of protons, but a different number of neutrons. The two resulting isotopes, their atomic masses have to add up to around 235 around being less because energy and neutrons are also being released. So what are those two isotopes? Well, it's actually kind of a range of them from zinc through the lanthanides, but one of them usually has an atomic mass of 90 to 100, most of them ranging from strontium to ruthenium. The other isotope usually has an atomic mass between 130 and 140-ish, and most of them range between tellurium and neodymium. Most of these isotopes aren't really important to the reaction after they're produced, but there is one that is. These isotopes are inherently unstable and very quickly undergo radioactive decay in an attempt to become more stable. The half-life of an isotope is the time it takes for half of itself to turn into something else. For example, the half-life of tellurium-135 is 19 seconds. Then it undergoes beta-minus decay, where one of its neutrons turns itself into a proton, emitting an electron and an electron antineutrino. Now that its atomic number has gone from 52 to 53, half of it is no longer tellurium-135, Half of it is now iodine-135. Then half of this iodine-135 beta decays into xenon-135, which is one of the most neutron absorbentous elements known to mankind. It's because of its ridiculously large cross-sectional area, which is far more likely to interact with neutrons. Once they do interact and it absorbs a neutron, it turns into the more stable xenon-136, which cannot fission. This xenon-135 is actually more formally known as a nuclear reactor poison. If there's enough xenon in the reactor, it can actually stop the reactor dead in its tracks because if it absorbs all the neutrons, 
no more neutrons, no more reaction. Practically speaking, it would be like if the gas in your gas tank started turning itself into diesel fuel because you weren't running the engine fast enough. The only way to really keep this Xenon 135 in check is to make sure that your reaction is running high enough so that you have neutrons left over after you're done bombarding this Xenon 135 so the reaction can keep going. If there's more inert Xenon 136 being created than there is 135, then there will be an enough amount of neutrons to keep the reaction going. This whole neutrons versus Xenon 135 atoms balancing act was just one of many balancing acts that the scientists at Chernobyl were responsible for. For this next part, I'm just going to name a thing that happens and label it as either increasing reactivity or decreasing it. First and foremost, 2% enriched uranium dioxide fuel increases reactivity. I mean, for frick's sake, it is the reaction. Cool water being pumped through the core absorbs neutrons, decreases the number of neutrons, decreases reactivity. A big part of what went wrong in Chernobyl is a void coefficient. A positive void coefficient, what Chernobyl had, meant that as steam replaced cool water, reactivity increased because steam isn't as good at absorbing neutrons. This positive void coefficient basically meant that the reaction was more biased towards increasing, making the entire reaction more unstable and therefore harder to control. Another tool for slowing down the reaction were boron carbide control rods. These were used to absorb neutrons. Less neutrons, less reactivity. However, these control rods, as you might have heard, were tipped in graphite. I am air quoting here because you might think of a tip as a small part of something, but graphite in these control rods were almost half of the control rods. Half inserted meant that the graphite was inserted into the core, fully submerged meant the boron carbide was in the core, and fully pulled out meant that the entire rod was out, the only thing in its place being water. So why is graphite so important? Because it increases reactivity in the core. For quantum mechanical reasons, slower neutrons are way more likely to interact with U-235 atoms. The carbon atom, what graphite is made of, is 12 times heavier than a neutron and has a very small absorption cross-section, meaning it would be far more likely to bump into and slow down a neutron than it would be to absorb it. And slowing down neutrons increases reactivity. With all of those variables in mind, let's move on to the night of the accident. It's my birthday, 1986. They'd been reducing output power in the plant for a safety test to determine whether or not the generators could temporarily support the cooling pumps in the case of a power outage. On April 25th at 2 p.m., they turned off Reactor Force cooling system to prevent an interference with the test. Also around this time, they were forced to postpone the test because the local area needed more power. The time is now 11.04 p.m. I would have to wait another 20 years for my dad to give birth to me. Also, the grid controller in Kiev gave the okay for Chernobyl to resume testing. Meanwhile, the evening shift that knows what's going on all leave. And between 11 and 12, when the night shift arrives, the power drops from 3,200 megawatts to 1,600 megawatts. The test called for a slow decrease in power from 3,200 to around 700 to 1,100 megawatts. By 12.05 a.m., April 26, they reached 700 megawatts. Now, a prolonged reduction in power in an RBMK reactor is bad. Remember that nuclear poison I was telling you about, the Xenon-135? Well, when the power output dropped below a certain point, there weren't enough neutrons to get rid of all the new Xenon-135 in the core, so it started to build up. After the power got to around 500 megawatts, it plummeted down to 30 megawatts, at which time Dyatlov tells Akimov to raise power to 700, in which he replies, I would like you to record your command. Raise the power. Dyatlov is a grumpy boy. By 1 a.m., in an attempt to raise the power, they pulled out 205 out of 211 control rods. Major safety features were disabled, including backup cooling systems, backup electrical systems, and backup diesel generators. And eventually, they got the power to stabilize at 200 megawatts. At 1.23 a.m., the engineers started carrying out the test by shutting down the main turbine generator. With less power going into the cooling system, less cool water reached the core, and the water that was in the core started to boil. Everything that was slowing down the reaction the boron control rods, the cool water, and the xenon-135 were gone now. With all the control rods pulled out and the cooling systems disabled, there was a power surge. All of the xenon-135 that was built up in the core, slowing down the reaction, was gone. Naturally, after seeing this power surge, the engineers pressed the AZ-5 button to lower all the control rods and stop the reaction. The problem with that is the control rods were taken all the way out. Remember, the bottom of the control rods are made of graphite, so the first thing going back into the core is graphite, which accelerates the reaction. Seconds after reinserting the control rods, there was a massive spike in power, which caused the core to overheat and fuel rods to fracture. This caused the graphite control rods to jam in place. This meant that the graphite control rods were now at the bottom of the core, 
displacing even more cool water out of the core. Because the graphite rods were stuck at the bottom of the core, this caused a huge spike in neutron flux, or in other words, this caused a huge density of neutrons to emanate from the bottom of the core. This, combined with the heat coming from the fuel, caused the liquid in the bottom of the core to heat up and rapidly expand into a gas. This is also known as an explosion. This initial explosion blew the 1,000 ton roof off the building, and seconds later there was enough hydrogen gas produced from the disassociated water and enough burning graphite that a second explosion happened, blowing chunks of burning graphite onto the roof of reactor 3, and the radioactive dust from all those unstable isotopes was carried hundreds of miles by the wind. All in all, Chernobyl was a freakishly coincidental accident. It almost seems like a recipe was followed to create this nuclear meltdown with like perfect timing and specific instructions and stuff, but accidents are just weird sometimes. Was this an objectively catastrophic event? Yes. But in the end, the brave men and women of Chernobyl risked their lives to clean up someone else's mess for the good of mankind. If they hadn't risked their lives, a lot of the Eurasian continent would be in some deep, deep shit. So thank you to those brave humans, and thank you for watching. Smash that motherfucking like button if you don't like nuclear disasters. Anyway, I will see you next time.